Hello, this is Richard Harvey here, introducing the walkthrough video for Abacus, our collection of instruments that are associated with childhood across the ages. A while ago, I was working on a Christmas album, and just before that, I'd worked on a couple of very much childhood-themed movie scores, and I found myself doing a lot of recording with real instruments in scenarios where I would have been, in many ways, better off using samples. So I thought, well, where is this collection that I'm looking for? Something that touches everybody with their childhood memories, uh, maybe even, you know, thinking about the childhood of their parents uh, before them and how all that's featured in entertainment over the years. I mean, one very good example of this is the fact that every Harry Potter film starts with something that sounds like a musical box. Well, we didn't have any musical box samples that could do that in that same way, you know, really playable as if you were playing a, a Steinway piano or something. So that really got us kick-started. Build the whole thing around the musical boxes and look at everything else that's been part of childhood, either instruments a child would play or instruments that have been associated with childhood. There's a lot of it that's sweet, but there's quite a lot of it that's dark and gothic as well. So I'll start with a few words about the musical boxes, as they really were the inspiration for making the whole collection in the first place. Of course, musical boxes were the home entertainment of the late Victorian period and the Edwardian period before gramophones came around. And they needed to be very small, so the sound ended up very high-pitched, which is why we all have the associations with them that we have. The original musical box was the cylinder musical box, which was really tiny, um, which has a much more fragile sound. And then later on, when people wanted an interchangeable songs, uh, the polyphon was invented, which was a disc musical box, and it was a lot stronger, a lot tougher, and the, the tines, which made the sound, were a lot stronger. So the, the sound was a lot more even, a lot more silvery. That's, that's why you'll hear the difference between the two types of musical box. They've got quite a surprising range, uh, around about four octaves for both of them. And uh, they capture the sound of that period very well, I think. OK, the next instrument I'm going to talk about is a child's plucked zither. This wonderful instrument was ubiquitous all over the Eastern Bloc countries. It was called the Skylark Zither, and many, many thousands of children would have had their first music lesson on one of these tiny little zithers uh, using little slips of paper that slipped under the strings to show you where to pluck in order to get your favourite tune. Uh, I really like this instrument. We used it on Gladiator. I really enjoyed playing it there, and I've always wanted to get a good sample of it. So here we go.
OK, I'm just going to have a quick word about the next instrument, which is the kalimba. And you may be wondering why have we got a kalimba, an African thumb piano, on a collection of historical childhood instruments. Well, the fact is that the kalimba has often been brought to the party when the sound of a musical box is required. And uh, given that that's the case, we thought we would record a kalimba that has got a, quite a wide range, uh, played quite gently with thumbnails, so it can be as much like a musical box as possible. Obviously, it doesn't sustain as long as a musical box does, but with a good long reverb, this can make a pretty decent job of sounding like a musical box. Metallophones. Now, a lot of the inspiration for this collection came from the pioneering work of the composer Karl Orff in the 1930s and his Schoolwerk project, which covered a lot of these instruments, instruments made playable by children, made affordable by children, and also brought children into the idea of music being a group effort, a social effort, a lot more quickly than might have otherwise been the case and, and, and sort of allowed ensemble music making to happen very early in, in the child's music learning. They're very different from an orchestral glockenspiel or an orchestral vibraphone. They don't have any resonators and uh, they usually have a smaller sound and a smaller range. They do a very different job. The, the first one here is a, a soprano metallophone which is a beautiful tiny little thing that would fit in your pocket, really. You could almost call it a sopranino metallophone. It's just an octave and a half, uh, diatonic, but of course we've made it chromatic. Uh, the second one is an alto. And now, like the recorder, it kind of sounds an octave lower than it really is. So, the, you know, the range on paper makes it feel like a soprano, and the same goes for the bass. I've always been really into the toy piano ever since we had one in my band back in the day. It's a really fun sound and you do hear them on TV commercials and in kids' movies and so on. The, the first two we've got are really classic 50 or 60 year old small toy pianos. They sound great, you know, they've got all the key noise and action noise that you'd expect in, in what is quite a basic instrument. And then we've got a slightly more modern one which is a much lower pitch, it's a bigger instrument that's got a better signal to noise ratio and a really good sound.
all the way through this, uh, we were, of course, noticing that these instruments are pretty basic. Uh, they're very charming, but they're basic. You get hammer noise and you get action noise, which is part of it, and, and a lot of the time we can accept that. But finally, I thought it'd be really good to take two of the toy pianos to bits and create an idealised version, one that can only exist as a sample instrument. It's played manually using a metal hammer and a wooden hammer, and therefore there's no key noise and no hammer noise. And, of course, we've got it chromatic, we've got it perfectly in tune, and it's kind of a luxury version, if I can put it that way. So um, this is a really big range toy piano, but with no key noise and no hammer noise. We're on to the section about the bells, the bells, here we are. It isn't always the case that children are, are playing bells, but bells so often appear in nursery rhymes and mentioned in children's songs that small bells, high bells, are really associated with children. So what I've done here is I've found three sets of bells, all of which have really strong historical connections. The first set is English handbells, which are very old, about 80, 90 years old at least, and they've got a very sweet sound. I think we all know the sound of handbells, but this is a, a, a very nice old collection. The second one we call suspended bells. These are actually sprung bells from a country house. So where the servants would sit downstairs, they would hear a bell and they would look up and actually see the bell still ringing because it was on a spring. And they would know which room to go to to serve her ladyship a cup of tea. But they're really sweet sounding bells and they're historical. The final set, we've called them chapel bells. Another name for them is sanctuary bells or prayer bells. And they're really cute little bells. They've got a lot of overtones. And with the three different mallets that we've used for them, we get a really nice variety of super cute, super sweet silvery bell sounds. These really are xylophones in that they're all made out of wood and we're back to the Karl Orff schoolwork idea here. Small diatonic xylophones that can be played by school children. Of course, we've extended the range a little bit and we've made them fully chromatic. But again, these sounds are not like their orchestral equivalents. They don't have resonators. They make a, a, a very sweet sound and somehow more compact. Thank you. 
The next section of the collection is nylon strings. Now, ukuleles have always been associated with children because they're a small and inexpensive guitar, basically. Uh, you learn to play the ukulele and it's really easy to make the switch from that to a guitar. So I don't think we could have done a children's collection without including the ukulele. When it says here, concert ukulele, it doesn't mean to say that you're going to the Royal Festival Hall to hear a concert of someone playing the ukulele. What it means is the bottom string is in the low octave and not in the upper octave, which was the obvious thing for us to do because it gives an extra four notes to the range. A normal ukulele would have had the bottom string an octave higher, which of course we covered for anyway because it's in the, in the remaining range of the instrument. So we have the concert ukulele, the banjo lele, which again is in the concert format with the low G string at the bottom. We've got a lovely collection of um, articulations on both of those and a full set of chords. And the bass ukulele, well, it's a modern instrument, let's face it, but we couldn't do a little mini ukulele orchestra without including ukulele bass. Uh, this one here would be an instrument using cello strings, and the bottom note would normally be an A. We've extended that down to a G, and it's a lovely sound and complements the other two ukuleles very well indeed. OK, we now move on to the Accordions Etc. collection. All of these are either child's instruments or student instruments. The first one is a lovely Eastern European children's concertina. The second one is a real children's accordion. It's tiny, tiny, beautiful thing made by the Hona Accordion Company, and it's called the Mignon, meaning sweet or charming in French, and it really is sweet and charming. With a range of only just over an octave, we've extended that a tiny bit, and it only has four chords. We've extended that a little bit as well. The next one is bigger still. It's a 12 bass accordion, 
and it's a Hohner student model. And by 12 bass, it means he's actually got six bass notes and six chords. And we've extended those as well. It has a two octave range going up from middle C. And this is a bit stronger. This is a bit more grown up than the, the child's accordion. But uh, this is a really playable instrument that can do a lot of things that a grown up accordion can do. Now, finally, the, the melodica is an instrument that I knew when I was growing up and playing the recorder, and it was a, a sort of accordion or a mouth organ for someone who didn't really want to play the mouth organ. These instruments have been made ever since, and you can still buy brand new ones, three octave ones made in China. You know, they've stood the test of time, but these are the original German ones, still the best the best made and the best sounding. What we've done here is we've taken a, an alto one and a soprano one and we've joined them together. They would normally just be two octaves each. We've now got just over two and a half octaves. This can be used in all sorts of different contexts where you might use a solo violin or an oboe or in, any other kind of sweet or poignant treble sounding woodwind. Okay, we have a little collection of flutes for you now, starting, of course, with the recorder. Now, recorder was my first instrument. I'm sure there are many people out there for whom the recorder was also the first instrument. I first asked my daddy to buy me one when I was three years old. I won't tell you how long ago that was, but the recorder I'm playing here is exactly the same model that I was given when I was three years old. It's a Dolmetsch descant recorder or soprano recorder as it would be called outside the UK and it's actually made from Bakelite which is very different from plastic in that it's a lot heavier and it feels a little bit like hardwood. So these came across as being real proper musical instruments in that day and, and were in many ways better than the wooden recorders that were first coming onto the market. So we've got a bit posh with this one. This is the, the solo one is the only one that we've done with legato because normally a kid playing recorder at school would not play legato. They would just play single notes with a single breath or a single articulation. But you would find maybe one or two more grown-up kids who'd actually learn to play with a bit of legato and a, and a bit more adult style. So we've done that here. We also have done exactly the same thing with the alto recorder, again, which is a 1950s, 1960s Dolmetsch Bakelite recorder. Really authentic, really period. Great stuff. Very breakable, though. So I'm glad some of them still survive. We then have a varied group of descant or soprano recorders, which is this, the recorder group high. And we've got, again, a varied group of alto recorders or treble recorders for the recorder group low. And 
a little tip, if I may be so bold here, is if you put all of them in together, it really makes for a much bigger and really homogenous recorder group. If you just use the recorder group high or recorder group low, it sounds very kiddy, very school-like. But if you introduce the two solo instruments in there as well and you put them all in together, it almost sounds like a recorder orchestra rather than a school recorder group. The final one in this collection is a tin ocarina. It actually is two ocarinas. We used an alto ocarina and a soprano ocarina because quite often the high notes of an ocarina can get very, very shrill. So we used a different instrument to recreate the high notes of the lower instrument and also to extend the upward range a little bit. So this next section is whistles, uh, not really woodwind because none of these are actually made out of wood. What we have to start with is a high G whistle, which is like a penny whistle. This is an instrument that was very, very popular in the early part of the 20th century. The, the one I've used here is probably from just pre-First World War, and it's made from brass, and it's a beautiful little thing, very even sound and very nicely in tune, and a sort of equivalent of, of a Sopranino recorder or the equivalent of a, a piccolo, but in a more simplistic way. The second group of whistles, it says Swanee whistles, and it, it is a combination of at least two Swanee whistles. Swanee whistles were introduced, again, in the early part of the 20th century as an instrument for people who weren't really musical, an instrument you can just introduce to your lips and blow and you'll get a sound. But we've done a bit more with it than that. It actually functions rather like a bicycle pump in that it's, it's just a tube with a plunger uh, changing the length of the pipe. So it's very famous for making glissando effects, but you can actually tune it to individual notes, and we've made the equivalent of a little pipe organ from it. And the final whistles are actually only whistles in name because they are sports whistles. They're lovely old things and they only play one note, long, short and some effects. But we thought we should include them and where better than to put them in the whistle section. When we were first thinking about percussion for this collection, I thought about the history of the toy drum and wondered how many children had been gifted a toy drum for their birthday or, or, or Christmas and how many of them would have ended up in second-hand shops only to be bought by me 80 years later or something. But seriously, we needed a, a set of percussion sounds that would complement everything else we've got in this collection. Not only, of course, recorded in the same room at the same time with the same set of microphone perspectives, but also instruments that were either actually historically genuine or really good reproductions. So we needed all of that. We also needed to respect the history of the, the Karloff schoolwork, and there's a lot of use of percussion in there too. 
The, there are shakers, little multicolored guiros, and a tiny little washboard we found, little triangles, tambourines, wood blocks, castanets, even coconut shells used to make the sound of horses' hooves, and bells and chimes, little symbols of the exact kind that Carl Orff would have expected to see in his school orchestras, the classic toy drums, a little toy bass drum and two toy snare drums, and one instrument that really is close to my heart. And anyone who's rattled a ruler on the edge of a school table or a school desk and got a really dirty look from the teacher will remember that sound extremely well. And I decided that I simply must make a ruler on table bass. We've got a set of auxiliary percussion which contains things like bicycle bells, those coconut shells, vibra slap, flexitone, glasses and even pencils being banged onto a tabletop. As was the case with my Andea collection, for orchestral tools. This was recorded at my own studio in Surrey, SML Studios, which has a medium-sized live room, which is by no means completely dead. It has some vibe, some atmosphere, some acoustic, and really benefits from some quite wide microphone positions, not just the, the close mics that, that are obviously essential in the case of a collection like this. It's really quite satisfying for me to listen to all the different mic positions and see how valid they all are. It's much larger than a booth that you would have in, say, a major scoring stage. Uh, and very often the solo instruments are recorded in a booth, so we, we get the added bonus of, of a proper room atmosphere here.
So, as you've probably noticed, the Abacus Collection is one that's very, very close to my heart. And thank you so much for allowing me to share it all with you. I hope you enjoy using it as much as I enjoyed making it. And can I also invite you to take a look at the behind the scenes videos and the other interviews that we've recorded relating to this collection. They go into more detail about the individual instruments and the way they've been recorded and, and mapped. And uh, I hope you enjoy the collection as a whole and, and find good use for it. Thank you very much.